American Experiment, I think I pronounced that correctly, uh, by uh, Matthew Gorbin. So Matthew, come on up. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm Matthew Gorbin and I'm a fourth year PhD candidate studying under Professor Gerald Cleaver in the Baylor University Department of Physics. Today I'm gonna to be introducing a research proposal that uses controllable mass objects to induce linear motion on an otherwise stationary harmonic system. Um, so like I was just mentioned, this is a Gedanken experiment or thought experiment so much in the same way that we use exotic energy and exotic matter to study the physics, the underlying physics of warp drives and wormholes, I'm going to be using these objects in which their masses can be changed. And these are theoretical objects for the time being. And I do go into some more details on some mechanisms for changing an object's mass in my paper. But for the purposes of this talk and due to time constraints, I'm merely going to address the physical system in which using these objects allows for induced motion on a harmonic system. Uh, so looking at a simple example of a hanging controllable mass object or CMO for simplicity uh, attached to a spring in a gravitational field, we see that this object can be adjusted from a higher mass state in red to a lower mass state in blue. And because the higher mass state has more interaction with the gravitational field, its equilibrium position relative to the lower mass state will be displaced below it. And so we're going to use this concept here in order to show that we can get driven motion in a harmonic system by simply changing the masses of our object. So we are going to initially start our system in the higher mass state at rest in its equilibrium position. We are then going to change the mass to the lower mass state. And we see that now after we've changed the mass of our system, that lower mass state has been displaced relative to its equilibrium position, it's been displaced delta x, where delta x is simply the distance between the higher and lower masses equilibrium positions. So after this mass change has occurred, uh, the system undergoes simple harmonic motion with amplitude delta x and will move upward to its maximally, com maximally compressed extremum position delta x above the lower mass equilibrium position. At this point, we will then change the mass back to the higher mass state. And we see that we are again displaced relative to our equilibrium position, except this time we are displaced to delta x relative to the higher mass equilibrium position. At this point, the system will move downward, again, undergoing harmonic motion to two delta x below that higher mass equilibrium position, where we have then completed one full cycle of our system. And we see that by, by only changing the mass of our object, we are able to displace the system and cause driven oscillations. And this can be repeated as many times as necessary. And every subsequent cycle, you'll see that we have an additional two delta x displacement below the previous position itself. So before I go into the more complicated two CMO, one spring system, I want to address fundamental conservation laws. In terms of the conservation of momentum, this one's actually pretty straightforward. Because the masses are changed at the extremum positions and because the velocities are zero in the lab frame, the mass can be changed at will. We know that any stationary object, regardless of their mass, will have identically zero momentum. So it doesn't matter if you change the object of a uh, change the mass of a stationary object, it doesn't change the momentum of the system. In terms of the conservation of energy, this one's a little bit more complicated. So we are, we are violating the conservation of energy initially. This is because we are changing the mass of our system. And if it is a closed system, we are seeing a total energy change of this closed system. However, this should be reassuring because this, what this means is that unless we input energy into the system to facilitate the mass change and cause these driven oscillations, we will see violations in energy. This means that we do not have a perpetual motion machine, assuming that we've inputted energy into the system. We aren't getting something from nothing. Again, this should be a reassuring fact. So now we're gonna look at the two CMOs, one spring system, where we're going to have two controllable mass objects attached via a spring. And this is going to be in free space with no uh, additional forces like gravitational forces interacting with the system. So the equations of motion for this system are as followed. They're the standard equations of motion for any two object, one mass system. And we can solve these to get the, the displaced positions as a function of time. 
Notice the initial conditions. Uh, for this example, I'm going to say that the spring has been in its starting in its maximally extended position where we have big X sub L and big, set, big X sub R as the initial displaced positions of the left and right mass. We've also imposed the condition that their initial velocities are zero. This is to address the conservation of momentum that I just discussed. And because these are both zero at identical times, we can then change the masses of these objects simultaneously without violating any of the conservation of momentum. And again, we are inputting energy into the system when we change this mass in order to avoid violating any of the conservation of energy. Uh, it's important to note that these are the displaced distances over time, not the real positions. And if you simply wanted to calculate the positions of these masses, all you would need to do is incorporate the initial spring length into the system. We can use these equations of motion to calculate the extremum positions of the system. Uh, so these are going to be the maximally extended and the maximally compressed positions as we cycle through this harmonic cycle. Uh, so we see that we start at x sub i, and we will then which is going to be the initial extremum position. In the case in the upper right-hand corner we see, this is going to be the maximally extended position. We will then evolve the system to its midway extremum position, xm, which occurs halfway through one cycle, tau. Um, and then assuming that no mass change occurs during the system, the cycle is, will just oscillate back and forth between xi and xm. Uh, again, this is standard harmonic motion. However, what happens if we do incorporate mass change? Well, the basic system goes as follows. We will start in our initially displaced position, x sub i, at rest, and we will allow the CMOs to be released and evolve to its, its first midway extremum position. At this point, we will be changing the masses such that the left mass, ML, will go to an ML prime, and the right mass, MR, will go to an MR prime. At this point, we will again allow the system to evolve at to the next extremum position. And it's important to note that this is essentially the exact same as just starting a brand new cycle of XI using the previous cycle's midway extremum position with the new masses. Then at our secondary extremum position, we will change the masses back to their original values. And at this point, we have completed one full cycle of the system, which like the hanging mass system can be repeated as many times as necessary. Now, the really interesting part about this system that we see is that after one full cycle, both of the masses have been shifted along the spring axis by the same amount. Uh, this will vanish if you assume that MR and MR prime are identical and ML and ML prime are identical, which is the exact same thing as saying that we don't have any mass change of our system. Uh, this can be simplified in one of two ways. We have a single mass changing. So in this case, we have the right mass is the only one changing and the left mass remains the same. We can also see a, a simplified system where the mass values have been switched. So in this case, MR becomes ML and ML becomes MR at the extreme positions and then vice versa as we run through the cycle. And this is gonna be the case that we're going to be analyzing. So we can see here that over the course of one cycle, after having changed the mass and going back to our original mass states, after we've gone from our midway extreme position to our initial, our brand new initial position, that we have shifted our system by a delta x, where again, like I said, this can be repeated as many times as necessary. In this case, the heavier mass is gonna be twice, twice as heavy as the lighter mass. And so where's the origin of this mass shift coming from? Well, it's a, a lot more evident when we look at these three different examples. So we can see with focusing on the bottom case that the heavier mass in red is going to effectively remain stationary in our system. The heavier mass is pushing and pulling the lighter mass through space. I like to say that this is inchworming its way through space. So we can see that when the heavy mass is leading the lighter mass in its maximally extended position, it will pull the lighter mass towards it. Upon mass changing, it is now trailing the lighter mass and will push it away. This is really the origin of that mass shift. And we can then use this shift value as well as the time it takes to complete one full cycle to calculate an effective velocity of our system. And it's important to note, this is an effective velocity of the system. We are not, the system itself isn't gaining velocity. We aren't gaining momentum. Otherwise we would be violating the conservation of momentum. We would have started from a stationary state and then gained velocity. It's merely moving through space at this rate, and that rate is induced by the mass shift that we see over the course of one cycle. We can then look at this velocity, 
and using some simplification techniques by addressing a mass ratio M, where M is merely the heavier mass over the lighter mass, uh, we can rework this velocity and we can analyze the limit where the heavier mass is much greater than the lighter mass, like I just mentioned in the previous slide. And we see here that the velocity is only going to be a function of the spring constant K, the initial displaced distances, and the, the smaller mass value. Because again, the smaller mass is really the one that's driving the motion of the system. It's doing all the movement. And so we can look and see uh, how much this traverses each length. And so again, looking at this animation where the heavier mass is 100 times as heavy as the lighter mass, this delta xm that you see here on the right-hand side is going to be the distance for every half cycle that each mass is moves. So we see in this upper limit that the lighter mass is doing all the movement. It's moving twice the initial displaced distance of the system and the heavier mass is not moving at all. And as this mass ratio uh, decreases towards unity, then we would see that these numbers sort of slowly approach each other. So then how fast can we move with the system? Well, we can see that our velocity can be scaled regardless of mass by simply changing the spring constant K and the initial displaced distances, where the initial displaced distances are effectively the input energy required to drive the system. So what do we want? Well, we want high spring constants, uh, noting that springs sum together in parallel for easy scalability, and we want large displacement. So we need to use long springs. So if we want to go a meager 10% of the speed of light, then we see that for low spring constant values, we need incredibly large distances. And this should make sense. We're trying to go 10% of the speed of light. We need incredibly large amounts of energy in order to move this speed. And we're talking distances on the order from the Earth to the moon. Now, if we wanted to work with a little bit more realistic distances, so for example, here, if we want to go about uh, one kilometer spring displacement, we would need spring constants on the order of 10 to the ninth kilograms per meter squared. Again, this is going 10% of the speed of light. And if we wanted to go a little bit slower, so we're talking 500 meters per second, which is the speed of Voyager 1, and we have a lot more realistic uh, spring values and spring constants that would certainly be achievable with today's technological capabilities, assuming you can overcome uh, the large hurdle of changing an object's mass. So here, if you want to work with spring displacement distances on the order of around 50 meters, you would need spring constants around 100 kilograms per meter square. So at this point, I'm going to be ending my talk on some future work. These are going to be points that I'm planning on addressing in future papers in this series that I'm writing on how to use control of mass objects to induce linear motion on an otherwise stationary harmonic system. So thank you for your time and I will now take some questions. How do you change the masses of your objects without violating the conservation of matter? Um, so really what we're addressing is the conservation of energy. So what you would effectively need to do is in input an amount of energy equivalent to the mass change of your object. So again, like I said, these are theoretical objects. Uh, so there are certain systems like the Casimir effect that you can uh, see mass changing of your object. So for example, if you have two parallel uh, cavities in a vacuum, and they're really close to each other, we see that the interior of the cavities gains an effective negative energy of the system. So, that, so if you're able to manipulate the boundaries of these cavities, you would effectively be able to induce a larger Casimir effect, for example, and you would then effectively lower the mass of your system. And you should see uh, these calculations have not been done, and I'm planning on it because changing the boundary conditions of, Cas of the Casimir effect uh, is sort of an emerging research, research field. So you see that the effective energy it takes to change the boundary conditions should be roughly equivalent on the same scale of the, uh, the mass change that you see with the uh, enhanced Casimir effect. So you are putting energy into the system equivalent to the energy change of your object itself. Is one of your baseline assumptions that the masses are such that they make the uh, make the spring mass negligible. Yeah, so I'm assuming zero spring mass here. Uh, spring mass here that would not really affect the actual motion of the system. 
uh, if you assume the spring mass, because again, all the mass change is going to be in the objects themselves, not associated with the spring. The Gendonkin experiment assume, assumes instantaneous mass change. Has non-instantaneous change been considered? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. And that is one of the things I'm going to be addressing in some of my future papers in this series. Uh, this does assume an instantaneous mass change. And so if we, in that, in that, this analysis that I've done assumes that. So I've not completed those calculations regarding a mass change that may occur over a non-instantaneous period of time. So look forward to future papers on that. But this, this does pose an interesting question about how we can actually create a physical system because, for example, going back to the Casimir effect, the boundary condition change would not occur instantaneously. It would occur over a short amount of time. So if we were to try to manipulate the system using real world examples, we would have to account for the length of time it changes to take, it takes to change that mass. However, that calculation hasn't been done and that's actually what I'm planning on doing after I submit this paper. How do spring constants in this compare to material tensile strengths? That, that's actually, uh, again, a really great question. And I had a very difficult time trying to find real world spring constant values associated with springs. I wanted to get some nice examples in the paper, but you don't really see real, real world springs give you, here's a spring constant value. Those numbers aren't really presented uh, when you're looking at springs. So I haven't gone that far yet. Again, I've sort of addressed the the theoretical system. And as you can see here, I'm going to um, be looking at real world systems by using the Casimir effect and using actual spring constant values, uh, for example. So I'm not quite certain about that information at this time, but it is something I am planning on addressing. As a materials guy, you should talk to me about that afterwards. I will, well, I've been, I was planning on saying hi later. Today, <laughs> so that's great. While you claim there is no violation of momentum since mass changes while masses are at rest, an observer in a reference frame translating at constant speed, which is an equally valid reference frame, would see a spontaneous change in momentum. How can you avoid this violation of conservation of momentum? Uh, that, along with things like relativistic effects of the spring, are things I need to investigate further. Um, again, I'm assuming that this mass change occurs locally in the lab frame, so I, that is something I need to ad address in the future, And but as, as of now, that is not something I've calculated. Matthew, great job. Thanks very much. Right, Appreciate thank it. You.